and thank you for everything and all the extra work that I know you did while I was away so that I could go away. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners, the Larrakea people, the traditional owners of the land which we met today. I wanted to talk a little bit about where I went and what it was, but more importantly some of the things I've been thinking about as a result and can we use some of those ideas here? And then I'll talk a little bit about Fulbright because I think there are some people who might be interested in applying. And apologies for anything I've covered that you already might know about the US. We all know patchy bits, uh, so you probably will hit some bits that you already know and uh, hopefully you'll hear something new that you didn't know. So I went... Here we go. Oh, this is quite good. So I was here. Look, this is my old teaching. Right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was here in Kansas, right in the centre of the US, and it's in the centre more than just physically. Uh, it's the, in the centre culturally. It's in the Midwest. It's a very conservative place. It's a Trump and Pence place. The signs are still up everywhere you go. Uh, it is a place that is very conservative in the way that it changes. It's very slow to change, and it's not handling change well, there's lots of change mm -hmm. happening around it. Uh, it's um, a long way from just about all of the coastal towns. And I spent a lot of time in coastal towns. I didn't understand the US at all. I'd finally got comfortable and was happy to go to the US. I found it scary the first few times I went there and starved a little bit. But um, as I, uh, as I went into the Midwest, I found out I didn't know anything about the US at all. It's a completely different place. One, it's flat. These are all the hills in Kansas. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and uh, well, there's one between where I lived in the uni and the shops, which kept me very fit so that I wouldn't end up coming back nice and round. Uh, it's, I was in Manhattan. This is Manhattan. You can see over it's got beautiful sandstone, and they've decided to build replica castles everywhere. So the university is replica castles, or lots of the um, municipal buildings are replica castles. Gorgeous stone, but it's quite strange. Uh, when I arrived, it was nice and brown like that, turned to green by the middle of the year. On campus, they run rodeos, they have a dairy which makes the most beautiful ice cream, including purple ice cream, and that will become clear why that's important in, in a minute. Uh, they have uh, their own large research farms. It's a big agricultural university. So more than 80% of the uni is agriculture. But it's also a land grant university, and I'll talk about that in a minute. These are the sort of houses that are around town. They were built in the 1920s, 30s. Uh, a lot of them are where the students now live. And so they're scattered around, around campus. I didn't get to live in one of those. I, I went and lived in, um, in the dorms. So now, where was I living? I was up here in Manhattan. Right up here. And I spent a lot of time out with extension officers. So it meant I got to go across the whole pretty much of the state. And I spent the first three months pretty much out in a car driving across those long, long, long flat areas. And what I hadn't really appreciated before either was that in the place is so intensively um, farmed. So those areas around Manhattan, the Flint Hills, are named that because they're full of flint. So they've never been tilled everywhere else, if it stays still long enough, something's going to be planted in it. So I've never really seen anywhere like that coming from here. It was quite a surprise. And one of the places that was really interesting was Dodge City, which is the Dodge and Doc Holiday and Wired Earth and all those sorts of things, and Garden City. So what's happening here in Kansas is it has been agricultural for a long time. So that's been sorghum, grains, cattle. Uh, everyone had little oil uh, rigs on their blocks, which I've never really seen before. And uh, a lot of wind farming is going on as well. So you have a lot of diversified businesses. But it is completely flat. And people talk about moving to the city and how scary it is, because you can't see people coming for miles away before they arrive at your house. And they find it actually really quite overwhelming to begin with. And this is why the university in Manhattan is so important, because it has a high proportion of the kids actually come from Kansas. It has about 30,000 students, um, the predominantly they're undergraduate, and it means that they have a high degree of students from that area building that pathway to their future. Now that pathway is really interesting because it's emptying those little towns. So what people, the story people tell all the time is, I live in the house my grandfather or great-grandfather built. He ranched out there and he built that place. And all my children and their children have left and they live somewhere else. <coughs> and they're not coming back and we don't know what to do. And there was a general shrug about it, even at government levels, about what to do. So this idea of 
what's happening in the West, generally in regional areas, of small areas empty, people conglomerating into larger spaces, and that just speeding up and speeding up, and people not quite sure what they're going to do about it and what decisions to make. It's really interesting. How do you keep schools going? How do you keep shopping centres open? Shopping centres here are really interesting. No one buys from the shop. You go to the shop to try it on and then you buy it through Amazon. So you, everything comes and goes uh, through online shopping. So there's heaps of endless em empty walls. Uh, there's towns that have been rebuilt after tornadoes. Sometimes a tornado is an improving thing, I'm, I'm told. That they get rid of trailer parks and then you can build nice schools and nice housing and things. But then there's no one to live there. So a lot of these towns are really emptying quite rapidly, which is going to have a significant impact on their future. The other thing that's happening here is they have been a predominantly white population for quite a long time. And they've forgotten their history in many ways. So when I look back at history and who lived there, the trains were really important. We all know about the trains opening up into the west. And it was Mexicans who were brought up to do that work and did a huge amount of that work. They talk about the cowboy history. Who did all of that? They were black cowboys. They didn't look like Randolph Scott and John Wayne. They were black cowboys in that region. Also, it was a very important place in slave history. So a lot of the slave wars were fought here, and this was a place that decided not to have, not to have slaves and actually allowed freed slaves to come there. And there are now also towns that are based on people from that history. But it means it's a really interesting population because that's all a long time ago. And over the world wars and the time after that of, of high agriculture and high input from Europe, the populations become very settled in what it is to be part of the Midwest and who they are. And they're being challenged now because who are the people who are arriving? People from Hispanic countries, uh, Somalians are coming in and Asians are coming <coughs> in. And they're the people working in these places like Dodge and Garden City because they've got large um, abattoirs or slaughterhouses, uh, that's where all the, all the feed, oh, they have feed lots for feeding up cattle before they go through the slaughterhouses. And they're doing all of that work. They've actually shown that um, if you didn't have all that migration, particularly illegal immigrants coming in, the price of food would double overnight. And the American economy is very much set up on cheap food and very expensive health care. It's a very interesting system in that way. So these places were really interesting. I also liked going out there because they smelt like home, it's so weird. But I would get out there, and when I go home every night, I pass stockyards, feed lots, and an abattoir every night. So when I, I would actually crave going out there. It's so strange, I know. But it meant that I, was, I belonged as soon as I and I went, ah, oh, everyone went, oh, good chicken today. Uh, the other great theory was that I would arrive when it was cold and would just get warmer. That was insane. I clearly had no idea. What it actually does is go cold, 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 just varying amounts of cold. <laughs> and when you think it gets a little bit warmer, it then gets really cold. So that's pretty much how I looked. The, the bus drivers were very funny. They said, we think that's you, but we can't tell because we've only ever seen this much <laughs> uh, once the sun came out. So interesting economy. Uh, but most of the country is like this. It's extremely flat, extremely open. And trees are really valuable. Trees are really important. People don't trim or cut down trees because so few grow. And because it's so windy, I've never seen wind like it. It's just constant all the time. The trees are all big, tangled, um, tortured looking things, but no one will touch them because they're so precious. But that's pretty much what you're looking at all the time. I arrived to this ice storm hitting the US and everyone was very worried about getting in because uh, the town was going to close down and they were worried about getting uh, flights in. So I arrived and the ice storm actually didn't hit Manhattan. The whole of town shut down to be able to walk up and down the driveway. You had to put salt out, all those sorts of things. But further along, back in Dodge, the place I showed you before, this happened. So what actually happens is the ice builds up really high on all of the branches. And because they're quite fragile, they're not trimmed, they're not kept in the way that we would, um, this is what pretty much every single house in Dodge and a lot of the towns in the region look like. It was a complete and utter mess. So that was quite a significant impact. We had tornadoes. I got locked into various places or ran across places when I shouldn't have. Uh, yeah, to your red shoes. Yeah, yeah. I think I should get them out at the airport, really. Um, but yeah, no tornadoes hit us while we were there, but uh, we certainly got lots of 
lockdowns. If you think cyclone shelters look scary, you've seen nothing to seen this. They were huge. Um, and the other thing that happened was big bushfires. So bushfires went across five states at the same time. Because you've got those big open flat plains, how do you stop a fire when it's like that? Not much you can do. Here we let it burn because it then hits escarpments or it helps country. There it's just constantly going through farms. That's all you're doing. And that wind was so fast. It was like a 50 mile wind just ripping across. We got to fly out in the governor's plane out to go to a meeting with farmers afterwards uh, to talk about what they were going to do. And what was so interesting was that they had, there was really nothing they were able to do. They were ploughing big dirt runs, but they, the, it, the winds were so high they just burned straight through. So it made a pretty much a big mess of the region, but it really showed up some of the issues. When we went to find out about the changes and what was going to happen next, uh, the, all the farmers that had stood up and fought got stu uh, were applauded by the, by the crowd. Now the next fire in five years' time, I don't know whether they will be the people who will be able to be fighting those fires. They've got a significant ageing population in those regions. So if we want these places to be our high agriculture places, they feed the world, how are they going to do that if everybody's going to leave? So they've got real challenges when it comes to emergency preparedness and the, the things that are going to change for them over time. <coughs> So I went there to talk about biosecurity. What's great about Fulbright for everyone who's going to go apply for them? There's the theory of what you're going to do and there's what you're actually going to do. And just be open to whatever happens. I met someone before I left and he, um, he, his theory was just say yes. So that was my theory too. Just say yes and be involved in whatever it was. Biosecurity and preparedness and improving uh, community engagement with biosecurity was the plan. But then we had all of these disasters. And one of the things they suspect is all of that uh, debris that got picked up from the ice storm made these enormous wood piles that went stretched for miles at the tip. And we went out and we were doing drone pictures to get shots of them. We think the sparks from burning those might have started some of the fires that happened in Kansas and then burned about 5,000 acres uh, over the next few days. So we switched from biosecurity, obviously, to emergency preparedness and building up community agencies. And what was really interesting was having the extension officers and having a university that is fully integrated into community to be able to work in partnership to address those issues. What was really common uh, with us is that there is an unrecognised, I believe, an unrecognised level of resistance to community engagement because the way that we do tend to do biosecurity engagement or any sort of emergency engagement tends to, to focus on the emergency because that's what we're worried about at that time. But for that community, it feels like another assault that goes on the other three assaults that happened before and don't necessarily recognise the strengths or the challenges for that community. To them it just feels like another whole lot of people coming and telling them what to do. And certainly when we did some analysis here in uh, the Territory about biosecurity um, responses, that was a real problem because it not only meant that people wouldn't do what they were asked to do, then Territorians, they actively found out ways to break the rules. <laughs> So instead of not just pulling up the plants, they then went and planted banana plants like they were planting dope plants because being able to break the rules and thumb your nose to authority, that's the best response you can give. So how do we recognise there's this level of resistance? Often not seen, not people who are involved aren't aware of it. And how do we start to engage with where people are, are at before we start um, emergency preparedness? And it was really interesting working with extension officers about that. The other common issue is I also got to work with government and uh, they said we have good community engagement but we do one, I said that one message but nobody reads it. And one of the really interesting pieces that I read over there was a book on post-trust and risk management. <coughs> and when we think about the world of post-truth that we now live in, to think about in 2007 this guy, um, um, Ragnar, Lofsted was writing, I always say Ragnar Lofbrook, I've just <laughs> watched too much Vikings in my life, Frank, clearly. But um, Ragnar Lo Lofsted writes about that if you do not trust anybody, and if you have mountains of information coming, you do not trust any of that information, it all gets washed away in, in, a, in a big sweep. And you can see that that's what's happening to a lot of these communities which feel like flyover states, they feel like they've been forgotten, they feel like they've been left behind. And that's what you're seeing in the news every day. That's a post-trust world. So in a post-trust world, who do you trust? 
Well, here it's, I know where I live, it's Joycey down the road. If I want to get a message to the Vietnamese farmers, I tell Joycey, because I'll go and ask him for sure, and because they know him and trust him. For in these places, they have the extension system, and the extension officers were really important in that trust system. So I think we're talking about in emergency preparedness, moving from a one to many, to a one to a, uh, to a broker to many. And we need to formalise that system. And I think the land grant system, one of the great things about it is it's helped us do that and make it formal and make sure it's normalised. So the land grant system, there's the land grant universities. You'll see the red dots, if you can see them, um, you can Google it later, it was set up in 1862 the stars in 1890, and then later the blue squares in 1994. The ones in 1994 tend to be black universities or black colleges and tribal colleges. Tribal colleges, I went to one, it was called Haskell, it's just like walking on a bachelor campus. It looked the same, it felt the same, it was very, very, very familiar as soon as I was there. But there's many of them and they will partner with um, a university, often a land grant university in their region. What the land grant system means is that there is federally mandated budget to be given to those universities via their state government, because they're all employees of the state government, to do extension work. So that means that you are actually funded to go out and make sure that your research is being utilised and that you're doing research that is useful to people. What a novel concept. <laughs> the other part of the equation that I think is really important is it means that there's a partnership with local counties. So for each place, and these are all the counties, they're about 30 miles square. The, the theory is it's how long you can ride one horse for one day to get from one side to the other side, it's that side of the county. So ignore the purple blocked up ones, I'll talk about them in a minute. But you've got 102 counties. For each of those counties, they have roughly two extension officers who are employed in partnership between the county, or the council essentially, and the university. Together they have a board which run them, and they are responsible to county commissioners as well as to the university. It means there is a partnership established, and they've had there since 1863, there is a partnership established to ask hard questions, to know who can answer those questions, and to work together on problems. And to take that learning into the next disaster or the next plan. I went and looked at um, this process in different places and they all do it completely differently. It's, it's all mandated differently in different states. But this idea that we're in it together and the university is there to help us. It has expertise which we can call on and people will come out and support us. We might argue with them, and they did. But it means that there is someone that is meant to come out and help and be a part of the solution or be an honest broker. I saw one example in California where there had been an awful water disaster and the first person they called was their extension officer at the uni because they knew they needed a good faith broker to come and have a really hard conversation about some really tricky stuff. Uh, it means that we were out at meetings um, and the university people would be facilitating the meetings to have hard conversations. The hard conversations here was about districting, which is what these have become districts. So when these uh, counties start to lose population, they start to lose revenue, how are they going to maintain their extension offices because they're so important? So they have actually banded together into grouping some of those um, counties together and then they're able to specialise. And the good thing about specialising is it's brought young people back to the region because they don't want to be a generalist. They want to specialise in doing one area of extension and it's really attracted some really exciting people back out to the regions. Uh, who were very inspiring. Now they work in lots of different ways. Uh, this is one example, this is the old hospital. They work in the bowels of the old hospital and listen to the ghosts walking around up the top. Uh, and they have a really nice space, people love being there and that's us sitting down in their space. Uh, they also have a partnership meeting once a year and I think this is very powerful. So that's what we're at up the top. The partnership meeting means extension officers from a quarter of that region all come together with the county commissioners, with the board members, with the stakeholders, with the university, and they plan for the next year what matters and what's important. And it also means some places they're able to change. So in California, urban agriculture is becoming really important. So every three years at that partnership meeting, they review where their positions are and they shift where the extension officers' specialisations are. So they're actually able to change as things change in their communities. 
and they had a process to have that conversation and argue stuff out and try things out. They were very um, good at, at just taking a chance on trying something. There was enough space in the relationship to, to try out something and see if it was going to work, which I thought was really good. The other thing was that the extension officers, you think will all be extension. In Kansas, they work across these five areas. The other strength I saw was that those five people, or who had however many in an office, all work together. In our system, if we have people who work like extension officers, because we don't really have them anymore, but the health person will be a miles away from, that, from someone who might be working in agricultural change in the community. They're not seen as part of the same system, whereas they actually work together. So if you go in an office, the person who's doing youth development, developing tomorrow's leaders or 4-H, it's sort of like, um, uh, imagine scouts with a whole lot of competitions. And they do competitions at the state fairs and they might be, you know, showing goats or making cheese or quilting or feeding the poor, whatever they, whatever they choose to do. They do all sorts of things. Health depends where you are. One group we're, going, we're doing, they've got federal funding to supply a phone service for anyone over 60 to be able to call up and say which health insurance should I be on this year because you have to renegotiate it every year because everybody's rules change every year. Really hard stuff, particularly if you haven't got, you know, you're not great at computers or haven't got regular access. It could be all sorts of things. The global food systems might be about improving what you're growing, but also one group was working on making high nutrition food for Africa, which is making a new market for, for the whole region. So it can be all sorts of things. And it also means they come together in a crisis. So when those fires came through, when the ice storms came through, you would see a whole group of these people banding up together and working on that together in partnership. It meant the university had 102 campuses, which I think is an absolutely fascinating idea for us. So it's not a campus that's separate from everybody else. Their campus is inside other people's activity. It's just normal that the uni would be there. And I think that's something special. I've spoken to Victorian governments about this and we've already looked at and identified the person who's the health person, the youth development person, the agriculture person. We just don't treat them as a system. I think that treating them as a system and facilitating people to work together could make a huge difference. So that was the big learning <coughs> from the, um, the grant system scheme. This is Haskell, uh, which is a First Nations uh, university in the 1883. I think it was, yeah, 1883. They uh, started with 20 students to become agricultural workers. I suspect it wasn't as nice as it is now. I suspect they were places kids were taken away from. Uh, people didn't say that explicitly, but it certainly had the feeling that people were taken away, put in dorms, and trained up to be good workers for the region. Um, one thing that was very noticeable from our experience is if you didn't go looking for it, you wouldn't know that that world really existed in Kansas. It's not a, it's not a, a world that's celebrated, it's not a world that's acknowledged, and a lot of you could just avoid it completely really, really easily. And it's so clear that, thank goodness, we don't do that here. Um, I don't know if you had the same experience, Peter. Yeah. yeah. If you go back to the American map, there's something that people don't really know about the American map. And if you go there. Do people know what this line is? And this is another thing that's kept quiet. quiet. This line there. Do people know what that line is? That's right. That's the parallel of slave and non-slave states. So that history of slavery was very, very quiet and the, the dispossession of Native Americans from the east to the west is kept very quiet. Yeah, it wasn't really until I went up to the uh, northeast that you started to see signs about where, whose land you were on and what was going on there. Um, but it was, it was really absent everywhere else I went. Um, oh, I am on the Navajo, mostly because you're on Navajo lands the whole time, but it was, it was really noticeable. Um, so we were very lucky, we went to a conference uh, held by First Nations, and uh, they were very suspicious of me when I first turned up because I didn't know what I was doing there, and then talked about sorts of things and the, how we negotiate partnerships and how we work together and uh, people are quite interested in that and want to have more conversations. 
So one thing about Fulbright I learned is at the end of Fulbright, you have all the relationships and partnerships to do your Fulbright really well. <laughs> oh well. Uh, so I'll have to go back and follow up because we now have invitations to go and meet with and work with a lot of people. A lot of people would love to come and see what we're doing here. They want to hear about your work and they want to get out on country and meet with people from, from their country. So I think that's fantastic and one, so there's lots of invitations. Hopefully some people will come over. So tribal colleges tend to partner up with a couple of reservations. Haskell works with uh, the Kickapoo and the Potawatomi. Land is very, very different. So we've got to go on land and see some of the um, projects that people were doing. What was really interesting here was up, up the top when we were looking at this project, all the land that was the arable, good agricultural land around the water all got sold off in the 1800s. So if you think about a reservation, all the good land sold, and is owned by someone else who feels it's their ancestral home. So they don't feel the need to negotiate or partner with the people on the reservation. And to do this sort of conservation work, they were doing some work for, um, some riparian work there. They can only work on the bits they can get access to, which isn't a complete system to change to taking care of country. It's quite complicated and quite challenging uh, for people. And the other thing was that we saw that because people have been shifted so much, their history of where they live and how that connects to land is quite different to ours. Um, the other thing is that the tax system was so different. So you also saw lines of casinos. So even in the smallest places, there'd be a casino after casino after casino. But what was interesting was the ones that were, had worked out the casino model, and often they partnered up with some big modern invaders, had a beautiful health centre, had a beautiful school, they had everything. And the places that hadn't done that was terribly, terribly sad because those things weren't available. And I just think that's just heartbreaking to see that disparity depending on where you live. Uh, so there's partnerships there that we want to follow up on. The next idea I saw was um, design thinking. I went over to Stanford and also to um, no, uh, UC Davis, MIT, MIT do it too. So design thinking basically says that you work from designing solutions to actual real life problems that real people have. Uh, yes, oh, of course. Okay. Um, so the Stanford one's great as well. But anyway, the idea is that students work on a problem for three years. These problems are real life problems. So they, this woman was working on something for Botswana. They were doing agriculture for non-tilled land, which means it's really hard ground. How can they make something that they could fix that was re replicable easily, that used simple uh, instruments that would put fertiliser and seed in the ground? They had a partnership between engineering, um, natural resource management and some, some other area. Their challenge was they built it and found it worked, but it put the fertiliser next to the seed. And what happens when you put those two together? Burn the seed. So they were learning all the way through. Now their comments about what it meant for their education and the way that they thought differently were really powerful. It made them think completely differently in a more multidisciplinary way. This group had to make a solution, I can't remember what it was for, but it was for people in the um, Amazon. They could only use things you could find in an Amazonian kitchen. So that was their pile of stuff and they were working from there. And they were learning how to curl things. Same sorts of questions, but it got people working a different way. At Stanford, it was about social innovation. So that space with lots of tactile stuff to work on, but it's enterprise development, um, uh, so solving more so so social problems. I've now seen these in the Arctic, where Arctic Indigenous people are doing this sort of work. MIT do it too. It's used for lots of different areas. I think this is something we could really use to change the way that we think about our teaching and our research, and the students' experience and how they connect all the pieces together across a degree. So that was something I'm hoping that we can t trial here and, and see if some of it might work for us. Ruth, was it a fab lab? No, no, but they're called as make spaces as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah, but they've just got um, like a group and they're called fab labs, fabrication labs. Oh, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, this is just an enigmatic person Doing it. who just did stuff. And I, I think that is a big part of it. The other really interesting idea from these people was the Great Plains idea. So this is a partnership between a number of universities. Each university says, this is what we do really well. This is our specialty, this is our strength. And we are going to teach a suite of units in that area. But you can go to any one of these five universities, I think it's five, and then you can, 
You can um, design the degree that you want to do. They'd love us to be a part of it because they've gone through our courses and they can see lots that they don't teach that they would love to get access to. Uh, so they've actually said that we like to become part of this as well. I think this is a really interesting idea. There's a financial model we've got to work through. But the idea of specialising in your areas of strength instead of everyone trying to deliver everything has great attraction. And they've worked out a lot of the nuts and bolts about how to make it work without killing everybody. So you end up with a good sized class, you deliver online, you might have um, workshops that everybody comes to from across the region. But they've worked out the financial model to make it work. I think this is really interesting and something we could play with. But they're really interested in our community development and the Yolngu studies. So, to finish up, this is Fulbright and I really encourage people to do it. Whatever you think is going to happen is not what's going to happen. That's the only thing I can guarantee. Say yes to everything, all sorts of fun stuff will happen. So, you might see a flower uh, that only comes out every few years and smells like rotting meat. You might get called into a... This was a fusarium uh, workshop yeah. and learn how to look at fusarium and try to understand what they were. But at least I can look down a microscope now, which I couldn't do before. You might end up, they have a biosecurity, top level biosecurity lab. They can work on things like anthrax there, really scary stuff. You might end up fully dressed up inside one of those actually doing experiments, which they threw away later, but um, working on genetic material. Who ever thought, I now have an appreciation for people who do that work because I know I couldn't, it's so claustrophobic. And what they go through to keep us safe is incredible. Um, you might learn about pistachio donuts and that's the end of your life basically. You have to spend the rest of your life avoiding the pistachio donut shop because it will drag you in and make you eat lots of them. You'll meet people from all around the world um, by going to lots of different workshops. They also hold um, an event where you all go to one place. So we went up to Minneapolis. We got to work in a feed the poor people warehouse where we were sorting food to get out to areas. We went to Cargill's, which is one of the biggest feeding of people in poor countries in the world, and we got to see how their business ran. We went and met uh, Vietnamese farmers who came over in the 1970s and revitalised the whole farmer's market uh, for the region. They said before they came, it was a pile of dirty potatoes. Now it's made out like jewels. <laughs> and uh, their children, who they then said, don't you dare do agriculture. We did all this so that you would go off and be doctors and lawyers. Well, they were business and marketing, and they'd come back and they said, right, we took over the farmer's market, now we're taking over the restaurants and shops. Mm -hmm. So their kids are now taking their, their parents' work to the next level. Mm -hmm. They're fantastic. Um, you also might find everything is purple. If you go to Kansas, everything, everything is purple, isn't it? even if you have nothing to do with the university. That is not a university bus. That's just someone has a purple bus with wildcats on it because they love it. Go to basketball, half those people have nothing to do with the university and the whole basketball uh, thing is full. The football stadium is enormous and it's a great photo at the bank, which is all purple. Because why would you need fans for another colour there where you can have all purple and you can all yell together? Um, if you wear a purple shirt, and the purple polo shirt with case you want, you don't have to wear a shirt and tie. Purple is that powerful. <laughs> so, you might find there's a whole new world you never imagined. I really encourage people to look at it. Um, the things I learnt were to think a bit differently about the world and to connect to people I'd never thought I would. I not only met people from the States, but also from around the world who are now going to visit. Um, so I've been invited to the Amazon, into Canada and all sorts of places that I would never have got an opportunity to do that and we'll invite them to come here and talk as well. Uh, the thing about Fulbright is the first hurdles are your project and your profile. But what they really want is ambassadors. Someone will come and talk endlessly to everybody, even in the shop when they come talk to you as soon as they hear your accent, which happened all the time. Um, I've been invited home to bring people like, uh, they want people who come and talk, who know their country and want to come and talk about how wonderful this place is, make connections and make new things grow. And if any of the things that interest you that I've talked about and you'd like to be introduced to people, I'm really happy to do that. Thank you very much. Um, the extension officers, do they have a role in facilitating research? Yes. So, 
What they'll actually do is they'll negotiate the sort of research that will go on in that place. So if you wanted to do agricultural work or from the community development, they'll actually put the researcher in touch with who can be involved. They'll get involved in making sure the activity works. So they'll be a local broker of liaison. Um, they'll help get reports written and information back to the institution. They'll also say, because um, they're in the university all the time for meetings, uh, they'll also say, this area really would like some work on, and this is a new issue for them, who would like to work on that? Or they might run workshops which generate those research ideas. And they're um, employed by the university? Yep. They're actually, they're actually uh, they, you know, they end up being half employed by the uni and half by the local county commissioners. And that's really interesting because it means they have to be faithful to the uni and to their home community all the time, which is hard. It's, it's not an easy tension to play with, but because they've been doing it for 130 years, they sort of know that game. And it also means that doing that in peacetime means when things are hard, you've got the relationships to handle it when it's really bad. It also, the challenge they faced in Kansas is the community's changing. So a place like Garden City now has an African supermarket, as I was told by everybody who's there. Or you go and there be signs in three languages. This is really new and really challenging for a lot of people. And we talked to county commissioners and they'd say, there's no one to take on my mantle and to do this next. And then who do we need to be extension officers? And they were finding that idea really, really challenging. But of course, that's what other areas have done. They've now got extension officers who represent all those new communities or old communities. And they're starting to change what they are as a result. So and they can be a career. Real, and it's a career. And yes. if there's training. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Uh, so you can end up now with the districting model, it means that there's much more of a career. And also some people are half academics, half extension officers, and if you're that sort of person, they're a great job. If you're a very applied researcher, mm -hmm. to be able to spend a lot of time on the applied side and be rewarded for that was very powerful. Yeah. So Ruth, what would be a challenge for us is that the USDA does all the regulation, and so they've got it sorted out so that they do the regulation and they leave the extension to someone else. Whereas here, the regulators are the extension officers and so there's a conflict. So it'd be good if we could think about some, another model where we could encourage extension work here but partnering with the DPIF or DPIR now. And that's why I think you need the uni in the model. Mm -hmm. that's, why, that's why the other extension direct model hasn't worked. But putting the uni in the middle and then being the employer means they can work in a slightly different way and they can be an honest broker in the middle. And that's the bit I think we need to do. I think we've got a real responsibility to do that. Yeah. But we've got it. I think it's not necessarily a huge investment. I think it's just about organising some things differently. But it might be a way that we could partner with government around new partnership arrangements that could be very productive. Do you have any exposure to the healthcare system? Or oh, yeah. Tell anything you would be interested in hearing? So it's a constant topic of conversation uh, because the repeal and replace was going on. Um, so, interesting. Politics, people talked a little better about it when I got there, and then it was never spoken of again. And it was kept really limited. So people would say, I want to say this, and then I do not want to discuss it further. So it was not open for discussion because it's so contentious and hard. And healthcare was wound up in that. So a lot of people had terrible examples where their parents, the choices they had were no choices at all. And what were they going to do? And what were they facing if repeal and replace went through? It was just awful. 10% uh, of the populations on, 10% uh, of Kansas had no healthcare at all. And it was really noticeable that everything you went to had a high degree of infrastructure for disability. It's like they're organised for high levels of disability. So you turn up to the basketball and there is a row of wheelchairs and young men will wheel you up and down the stairs because there's that many people in, who need wheelchairs to get up and down the stairs. Mm -hmm. Walmart is full of electric scooters um, with, for free that you can ride, ride around. Well, that's great, but hang on. Why do we have 40 disabled places outside of Walmart and electric scooters? Because the healthcare system has driven that. A lot of people talked about um, that they test, so they wait till they've all got the same sickness in the family and they send one person to go and find out what it is and share the drugs or try and get to Canada and get the other drugs or get it some other way because you can't afford everyone to go because everyone gets sent for a test. 
and the whole, so going for a cold to ten thousand dollars is nothing because you get sent for all these tests because that's the business model mm. and it's a risk you can't take um, and I noticed too that the dealing in it's, it's really weird so people who have access to healthcare and to drugs not high level drugs but all the sort of the cold medication and codeine and that stuff sort of help each other out because you can't afford to go to a doctor to get that stuff. Um, there's lots of drugs of certain sorts in the supermarket, but as soon as, you, like asthma, I couldn't get a puffer. Whereas here I just go to the chemist. Uh, I'll start, I, I've never paced out my puffers so carefully in my life <laughs> because I wouldn't have been able to get another one. It's a pre-existing condition. It would have cost me an absolute fortune to go and get another puffer. Um, as a woman, you have lots and lots of pre-existing conditions. So these are huge challenges. Then as you get old, everything's a pre-existing condition now, so nothing is covered by health insurance. And you have your options just get more and more expensive. And families are under huge amounts of stress. And making decisions about healthcare are really, really hard. The other thing I noticed is um, the food thing. So food is cheap, and food is pre-packaged and pre-prepared. Because it's cheap to do that, it's so cheap to have... I, I couldn't make cakes from scratch as gifts. Mm -hmm because it's all pre-packaged, because it's so cheap to do that, because the labour's there to do that. So the model just pushes you further and further and in, into a poor health life. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing with that was um, uh, that people all have two jobs. It's very rare someone has one job. Everyone has a side hustle. So if you want Uber's fantastic because someone will pick you up any minute of the day. Now, I really didn't think I could get an Uber at 3 a.m to go to an airport, um, no problem. Because everyone's got a side hustle because they don't have enough money. And if you don't, if you work less than 15 hours, you don't have health insurance. So you've got to have a second job to pay for health insurance in case something goes wrong. So you work extremely long hours. So what do you do when you get home? Rip something open, stick it in the zapper. Because that's what you can manage to do. And Cornelia Flora has done a brilliant book on uh, sustainable rural communities and she's used case studies from the Midwest all the way through uh, and it shows that transition from a, um, that life where you cooked everything and you ate around the table to an unhealthy life mm -hmm. because that's how life has just got pushed and it's just so easy because that, that's the bit of life that's cheap. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was really quite scary and the impact on older people making these decisions because all the rules of what you could afford and how many pairs of glasses you got changes every year. How do you renegotiate all the bits of your hair? Hope you don't have one, you have several, you have top-ups. And you renegotiate all of them every year. I don't, I, I, I don't have the brain space to do that. I don't know how anyone else does it. So it was a, and it was a constant topic of conversation to the point where you'd be walking down the street talking to someone and people would come in and join in the conversation, complete strangers, because it's such a big issue for people. Yeah, the healthcare stuff is really interesting. It was a, I, I tell you what, it was a, it was a civics lesson, because every time something would happen, you'd get told, right now, the Wiley can't do that is. <laughs> and the system is, so it was very much being, ex because of all the chaos there, you actually learned an awful lot. Um, and people are very willing to talk about it and want to talk about healthcare and those sort of things. Ruth, uh, what's the minimum wage in Kansas City? Oh gosh, I can't remember. It, because they've got the university, because they've got agriculture, and because they've got defence, it's probably not that bad, but it is dropping. The so impact has been that they've had agriculture, the bottom has fallen out of the market, so what everyone used to have over a new car in three years, now they can't. And they're finding life a bit tough, so the kids are leaving, so they've got no workforce. So it's a contracting economy. At the same time, the governor has decided to go for a no-tax economy, so that means if you get in trouble, so all your crop insurance, all those things have disappeared. So if you get in trouble, you'll get less and less and less support. The only people who get any help are people who are successful. So it means as soon as you're on the slide down, it, the, the gradient tips and it becomes very, very fast. I mean, the minimum you know, legislative wage in some states is as low as $7. Oh, well, people yeah. are being paid three, 3 or $4 an hour. And that's, yeah. that's actually, on, in Illinois, it's about 9 Indiana, it's, uh, I think it's about seven, uh, and that's in areas where you get tips. It can be as high as eight, but you can understand why people need to 
have two jobs. Oh, I've heard my theory. And, and why you've got so many people uninsured. And it was really interesting, like this, it's $7 now, people would think that was luxury, luxury. Um, because they were really shocked at how, I've been asked this, I don't know how many times, how can your minimum wage for hospitality be $20 an hour? Your food must be so expensive. How can you afford that? Because I would never, ever earn that. They were really shocked how well people were paid. Um, but when you look at the price of a thing, it might say it's $12, but once you add to tips and taxes and all the rest, it's about the same as what it costs here. It's actually not that much difference, really. Um, they were really shocked that we would pay people that much. We're in the Panama State tax, no, no tax state. Um, very, very low, 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 very low. So how do they, how do they deliver services for the state? They have decided to put much longer periods on delivering service. So the roads are going to get upgraded every seven to eight years instead of every four. So they'll, you'll, they'll just run everything down. Mm -hmm. And by the time that happens, it's that's current a governor will That's a roadmap going. to annihilation. There's and there's also yeah. studies that show the places yeah. that we have high tax Being accountant from a tax perspective, I'm sorry yeah. guys, I'm an accountant. <laughs> that makes no sense to me. So the, Not that I'm a tax the states that went for high tax and the states that went for low tax and the states that went for high tax options are all flourishing. Yeah, they would have. They invested. And the ones who went for the low tax thinking that would attract investment and attract people to come back and it would help people just get on and out yeah. from the, the yoke of government yeah. are all falling over it. And it's yeah. really scary right now. Well, that's a good lesson. And then, Hopefully, and if they pull out the Medicare numbers, numbers, they pull out the Medicare investment, which is what has been threatened, mm. then they won't be able to cover the health bills. Ruth, what was the age profile of people working in Walmart? Mm -hmm. How would you have very old people? Oh, well, they're mostly young, actually. Because mm -hmm. in Illinois, we had people who were well into their 80s. Mm -hmm. so so much. No, they tend to be young. But they um, work short hours and they're fairly highly exploited. It's not, it's not as attractive. Yeah. Anyway, thank you very much for coming on the way. I'm sure you've got lots more interesting things to do. Thank you so much. We love it.